Good evening, everyone. This is the last tea time, hopefully ever, uh, as COVID-19 hopefully comes to a close. We have Mrs. Chaminsky, who is a forensic nurse and has spent a lot of time also doing uh, COVID-19 related stuff. Uh, she's going to present uh, tonight and then uh, we'll open it up to questions like we usually do. Just for some background, Mrs. Chaminsky, the, uh, one of our previous tea time guests was a forensic psychologist. So uh, I don't think there were a lot of questions asked of her regarding that process. There were some, but, but I think most of the questions, she mostly works with children, abused children. So, um, okay. so I think that they were mostly around, around kids, uh, the most of the questions, but I hope you all will represent the program well and uh, be talkative, ask a lot of questions and, uh, Welcome. Thank you very much for doing this. Oh, of course. Thank you for having me. I apologize. Somehow I lost my voice today. I don't know how that happened, but I feel fine. Just may sound a little off. <clears throat> so. Sure. I'm also not great at the computer. So if anybody has any questions or anything, then please stop me, Dr. Char, you know, let me know what's going on if anybody needs anything. Okay, Caitlin, Caitlin's sitting by me just in case I need anything. So welcome, well, for um, those of you who don't know me, my name is Tara Chaminsky, um, I am Caitlin's mom. Um, so Dr. Char asked me to present for um, my job as a forensic nurse. So I'll go over some background. Again, anybody has any questions, feel free to stop me. I put together just some basic information just to kind of explain to you what I do and what you would do if or when you were sexually assaulted. Um, so with that, we'll get started. So as part of my background, I graduated from Seton Hall University in 1997. Um, where after graduation, I started working at Marstown Medical Center. I've been there for, I'm going on my 24th year. I originally was in the cardiac unit, um, doing all different types of cardiac procedures. And after probably about 15 or so years, I was getting a little bored, wanted to always was interested in becoming a forensic nurse and the Morris County Prosecutor's Office was hiring, which is um, when I decided to apply for the job. In the midst of that, I changed um, areas. So I work across the street from the hospital now. I work at the same day surgery center um, where we do same day surgeries, a lot of orthopedic surgeries, plastic surgeries. I think you had Dr. Bassett on. I actually work with her. Um, do pediatric surgeries, that kind of thing. <clears throat> um, and I'm currently still working as a forensic nurse and also at the Mars County mega site as an Atlantic Health employee doing um, COVID vaccinations. <clears throat> so what we're here to talk about mostly for my forensic background is I am a sexual assault forensic nurse. I do adult and pediatric sexual assault cases for Mars County. What mean, that means is I work for the prosecutor's office. Anytime there is a sexual assault that is brought into a Mars County hospital, meaning Dover Hospital, St. Clair's Hospital, or Mars Town, um, we would get called. So objective, um, let's, let's start off with what is a sexual assault? And I know some of this may information may be uncomfortable. I'm very non-formal. So if anybody has any questions, doesn't feel comfortable with anything, please let me know. I tried to keep it as um, Catholic school G-rated as I could. If um, I may interrupt, I, I, I want to second you on that. I am also very informal about it because I, I, I want to empower people to <laughs> to be able to deal with, with it. Cause it's something that everyone is going to have to deal with through acquaintances or, you know, your God forbid yourself. But, um, Absolutely. we have been in the AP class. We have just about finished the sex and reproduction part of, 
of the physiology part of the course. Uh, so, so we were moving on to the, I, I, I call it sex, society, and responsibility. We're going on to the society and responsibility part. So I'm hoping that sort of sets you up for like, this is the, this is the bad part. Right. Uh, and, yeah. and hopefully, hopefully that'll, that'll help. So you should feel comfortable. I back, I'll back you on anything you say. It's not, you, you're not going to be able to say anything that's going <laughs> to be angry about. Okay. 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 <laughs> Thanks. And I'm a nurse. So I tend to talk about stuff like it's not a big deal. And I forget sometimes my audience. So keep, keep that in mind. <clears throat> so let's start off. What is considered a sexual assault? So a sexual assault is an act in which a personally, a person intentionally sexually touches another person without that person's consent or physical force on that person to engage in a sexual act against their will. So that's the big takeaway from that is that it is a non-consensual act that considers it a sexual assault. <clears throat> um, I work um, as part of a team and this team varies in people. We have what's called a, um, a sexual violence advocate that is a volunteer that also works with the patients if wanted by the patient. Um, we also wor work hand in hand with law enforcement and then there's the forensic nurse. So sometimes we work in combination and I'll kind of go through all of that. And if you guys have any questions about that, let me know. So we all were part of the, what's called a SART. You'll hear these terms kind of passed around, a SANE and a SART. A SANE is the sexual assault nurse examiner and the SART is the sexual assault response team, meaning the advocate, law enforcement and the nurse. So we each work independently doing our own job but our goal is to come together um, to be victim centered and to know that each case is unique. And our main goal is to make sure that that victim, the patient is taken care of. <clears throat> um, the other thing is to remain, we all need to remain objective. And each of us sort of have a different role in the patient. Um, so we do have to kind of keep reminding ourselves that we need to remain objective in each case. <clears throat> so a sexual uh, forensic nurse is a registered nurse who undergoes additional training. Um, somebody is available 24 hours a day, seven days a week. So if some patient were to go into a hospital for a sexual assault, one of us would get called. So I am usually either working at the hospital working at the mega site or I'm on call for the prosecutor's office, you will rarely ever find me not at some job or on call for a job. Um, our job is to maintain um, um, a basic health history of each patient, which is very important along with the details that they're telling us what happened from the assault. From the details that are given to us by the assault kind of gives us a basis basis of where our exam is to start and kind of look at it as the patient tells us what happened and their body is the um the crime scene so basically we are then examining the entire body from head to toe looking for signs of a crime so that's really our job um Again, we document the findings. We um, do everything from photographs um, to documentation. Um, we also treat with medications for possible um, sexually transmitted infections that they may have obtained during this assault. We could treat for possible HIV infections, um, pregnancy prevention, um, we provide discharge information for when the patient is to be sent home and what their life looks forward from discharge from the hospital moving forward. So they always have support um, from social workers, from advocates. There's always somewhere they can go. And also our job is, is if our case does go to trial, um, our job would be also to testify in court um, for that patient. Um, so there's criteria 
for us to be activated, um, the victim has to be at least 13 years of age. The assault has to happen within five days. And the victim has to consent for activation, for one of us to be called. Sometimes it's just law enforcement, which law enforcement typically talks them into having the nurse, forensic nurse come in. And sometimes um, they want an advocate there. With COVID, the emergency room was not allowing any visitors. They were not allowing for advocates to come in. They were available by phone. And in the heart, in the beginning of COVID, when it was really bad, law enforcement was not going into the emergency rooms either because they were for fear of law enforcement getting sick and then not being able to be out um, doing their job. So <clears throat> with that said, um, again, they would contact a patient, if this were to happen, contact the police department, hospital, or um, a hotline, if they've seen a hotline number somewhere. Um, so this is just some information, what I just kind of went over. <clears throat> so there are some exceptions. Like I said, we deal with patients that are under 13. Do patients under 13 get sexually assaulted? Absolutely, absolutely. Um, it's very unfortunate. Um, those stories are usually a lot sadder um, because it's usually by a caretaker or a family member. Um, if the assault happened more than five days um, prior, our job is to make sure that the patient is okay. Um, just, I'm sorry, I saw something come up on my computer. I didn't know what it was. Um, I'm just looking to see. I'm not very good with the computer, so. Um, if it happened more than five days ago, we cannot collect DNA evidence. There's really nothing that's gonna be left um, after that five day window. Um, but law enforcement is still available and we would still treat that patient for any possible injury or anything like that that might come up. So the age of consent in New Jersey is 16, which everybody would think it's 18, but it is actually 16 with some exceptions, which I will go over in a minute. Um, and 13 year olds can engage in consensual sex with someone who is not more than four years older than them. So they can be three up to three years and 364 days older than them. But once they hit that four year mark, it is not considered consensual, which is, I always find mind blowing. <clears throat> um, so um, just if these are considerations, if the parent requests, if they suspect that their child was sexually assaulted and the parent brings a patient to the emergency room and asks us to do a sexual assault as exam on the patient, just because the parent wants it, that is no reason to do it. We cannot do it with a parental request only. Um, also, if the patient is unconscious, um, under the influence of drugs and alcohol, I got called in one time for a 15 year old who overdosed um, and was in ICU. And I could not do the case on the patient because the patient could not consent to it. The parent was at the bedside, the parent wanted the exam done, but the patient was not awake. So I could not do the exam. What happened? They called me back two days later once the patient woke up um, and the patient refused the exam. So again, the patient was taken care of in the hospital, made sure that she was okay, that she was safe, that she had a safe place to go home to, but we did not do the exam. Um, sometimes the physical injuries are too severe. They may require surgery if it's a, a knife wound or if the patient was a strangulation case. Um, sometimes those patients, the medical part of it takes priority. So we would take a back seat to that. And I have gotten called in on cases where the patients were not medically stable. Again, I'm alerted to the case. I would just be 
you know, I would just tell them, give me a call back when the patient's stable and the patient's able to communicate and have a conversation with me and tolerate, um, you know, what I'm, my exam. Um, and victims that are not reporting, this is another thing we'll go over. Um, if a patient comes in and they're nervous and they don't want law enforcement involved because they're not sure, they don't want to get in trouble, you are still able to have a sexual assault exam. Um, what happens is, is we would take all of that information. I have it on the next slide. <clears throat> um, we would have take all that information, and that would sit at the prosecutor's office. The only thing is, no evidence would be processed until law enforcement is involved. Because anytime we submit anything for um, DNA evidence, it goes to the state crime lab. So law enforcement does need to be involved, but the patient does have up to five years to decide whether they want that to, to go through with law enforcement. Um, okay, so every victim, again, every victim has the right to consent or decline any part of the exam. So if I go in and I start talking to the patient and they're not comfortable with me taking photographs of them or any part of their body in, of injury, they can decline that part of the exam. If they decline to um, have any specimens taken from them, that is completely fine. That is their, their will. They can decline any or all parts of the exam. Um, and an exam is not performed without consent from the patient. And if the patient is unwill, um, unable to give consent in a capacity as far as mental um, capacity, we do do a lot of mental health patients, um, then we would need a power of attorney. <clears throat> um, I think I did cover a lot of this in just talking. <clears throat> okay, so far as mandatory reporting. So if any victim is under the age of 13 years old, law enforcement has to be notified. That is a game changer. Anybody under the age of 13, law enforcement has to be notified. Any adolescents between 13 and 18 that was assaulted, non-consensual. It's someone that is acting in a supervisory power, a teacher, a coach, um, a caregiver, a friend's parent, sexually assaults you between the ages of 13 and 18. That has to be reported to the police. That is a mandatory reporting. And if a victim was assaulted and there was a weapon involved, it's a mandatory reporting. I had a 16 year old patient once who came in and she was assaulted and um, the perpetrator had a knife. So I then had to um, report to law enforcement. She did not want it reported to law enforcement. She was living in a foster home and did not want to be taken out of that foster home for what had happened. But I did have to notify law enforcement um, about that case. And um, what happens with those cases, especially when they're younger, um, I think you guys have the social worker on. This is where social workers would get involved. Um, DCPMP, which is the old DIFUS, the um, Department of Children Protection and Permanency, that's where they would get involved because this is not just a one-time thing that they're looking at. They're looking at the life of this patient where they're going from here and making sure that they're um, being well taken care of. <clears throat> so during my assessment, I would talk to the victim, um, find out what happened that night. We get photographs. Um, I would, again, check the patient, the entire body for any injury. We photograph each injury. Um, also, um, you have to, we learn in uh, forensic photography classes that you have to take pictures of patients to also show um, in relation to where the injury is on that patient. 
if the patient's sitting in a bed, you have to take a picture of the patient, a distance picture for uh, showing the patient in the bed. And if it's their right arm, you have to show something that's in relation to that right arm. And then you would start to get closer up to that, um, to that injury. So we do take pictures in series. Um, any um, injury can be from any sort of abrasion, from any um, dragging across the floor, any carpet burns, um, any slapping. Um, I actually had a patient who came in and said they had a five star, which I didn't know what a five star was. And they showed me it was the entire handprint of this, the perpetrator on her on her backside his entire hand in a bruise on her hand so five star five fingers I didn't know that until she showed it to me um, but it was a pretty impressive bruise um, so also what we're talking about when we're talking about injury is how did the injury occur was it a slap was it a squeeze was the patient choked how much force was used? Was the patient tied up? Was the patient um, duct taped? Um, unfortunately, um, these are all things that I've seen. Um, and sometimes the patients come in, their injury may not be visible. Um, if anybody's seen anything in biology, we um, use what's called an alternative light source or an ALS. Um, you may have heard of it, a uh, black light, if anybody watches any of the crime shows. Um, you are looking at the, the way the hemoglobin hemolyzes under the skin. So some experts, I cannot, but they can stage bruises actually by the um, degree of bruising under alternative light source. And it does actually have taken classes where it actually gets specific as to the wattage of the alternative light source um, when starting to stage bruises, which is a whole specialty in and of itself, which is extremely interesting. Um, so here you can see here's an injury of a bruise on the back of an elbow. You can also see there's some abrasions on there. <clears throat> and this is used with the alternative light source. So this is the same injury, but seen differently under that black light. So there's some, I don't know if you can see my mouse. Can you see my mouse moving if I move it on the screen? Okay. So if you look down um, the back of the forearm on the patient, you can't really see too much there, but when I click to the next slide, see how that bruise is actually coming through. So I've actually had a patient one time who was explaining to me how um, force she was held down by, um, the perpetrator putting her his hands around her neck the assault had happened a few hours prior when I looked under the with the black light and I asked her to show me where his hands were I actually under the black light I could see his finger marks on her neck which corroborated with her story which is you know part of our what our job in the in the long and short of it is <clears throat> Um, another important piece of information, just because an injury isn't visible or you don't see any injury, doesn't mean that an assault did not take place. So if you're ever in a situation where you, somebody you know, somebody you've heard about doesn't have any visible injury on them, that don't, that doesn't mean you don't want to go to the hospital and get, get some, um, some care. Um, Injury doesn't always show up in physical also. There's also the emotional and the mental um, help that these patients will need after. Um, <clears throat> so some things that we would see. So for oral penetration, sometimes we I've seen, um, they're called petechiae in the roof of the mouth, sort of like those red little dots if you've ever had strep throat or if you've talked too long, had a sore throat and you've taken a flashlight and looked in the back of your throat, you may see what are petechiae. You probably don't know what they're called. They look like red, red polka dots almost. Digital penetration, we do see um, lacerations in the vaginal area. Some of these terms are just 
um, different anatomy of the vaginal area. Um, sometimes we do see bruising. We also see lacerations, tears, um, uh, debris, foreign debris, leaves, dirt, all that kind of stuff. Same thing with anal penetration. We do see all of that also. So this is just some of the documentation that we would do that you could see on here. Um, we do full body documentation. Um, I didn't put up the slides, but we do have also um, male anatomy, female anatomy, and anal anatomy that we also document on. So you could see this is um, an easier way to see this, that on this patient, if we look at this first one here, that there was a positive ALS. That means that there was a hit on the black light. That means we took the black light, looked at the patient, and we could actually see bruising under that. And everything kind of corresponds, so it's a little bit easier that we can see it up here, that there was also some debris that was found there, some, um, um, this, every, every part of the patient, we look with the black light. I comb over the patient. From, I, think they'll know, I think they'll know what that, that is. You can, you can actually say. What? If you were hesitating about what that is, the, they oh. know. So oh, you can say it. That would yeah. be semen. Yes. Right. Yeah. So that would be dried semen on the body. So act, even if it's dried again, it will dry clear. But we can see that under under the um, the alternative light source that will show up. <clears throat> this is um, another way that we not only um, document injury. This is a um, a ruler. There is a lot of different things on that ruler that is a standard in the forensic field. The gray coloring, believe it or not, is a standard color. Um, to, to wash out any purple bruising, any red bruising, um, and also to document the how big an injury is. So that gives, if you were to go to court and this were to go up on a presentation, this would explain how big this injury is. And you might not be able to see it, but I'll show you in the next slide that there's actually a finger length mark right here. And you could see it right here, and there's one right here. So that's what the the different light sources that we have. <clears throat> so, does anybody find that fascinating? I I find this all of it very fascinating. <laughs> I think it's just um, I just think it's unbelievable that what the human body can do and does do, and now in forensics. Um, nursing, we are treating that body as a crime scene and looking for what happened to this patient when this patient may not know, may not remember. Um, this is this is our job to kind of put their pieces back together for them. So with each patient, we have a standardized kit and that um, the standardization is usually different from state to state. So any county in New Jersey will have the standard the same kit. Um, has everything that we would need in it. Um, our report goes in there. Any um, swabs that we take from the patient, whether it be a wet swab, swab or a dry swab, um, we would collect DNA evidence on, would go in this collection box. Um, everything is labeled with the patient's name. There's always a case number and our name on it before it gets sent down to the crime lab. Um, we would also collect any clothing, bed sheets, um, anything from the scene that it possibly could have happened at. Um, anything that we can get, we will collect. I had a patient come in one time um, who was going through a divorce and was strangled and sexually assaulted by her husband who wanted to come over just to talk about um, selling the house and he sexually assaulted her and there was semen all over her boots. Um, so she came in and I had to take both of her boots and it turns out that the crime lab did, did find his semen on those boots. So that was a, a good win.
I used to have uh, the forensic nurse, one of one of the forensic nurses from Baltimore, uh, do this class when I was in when I was down there, and she said that the package that you're describing would always be sealed with a certain type of tape and opened from only one side by each of the. Is that how you guys do it too? Like um, the top is not- only one group. The the bottom is only another. No, our our um, entire case is sealed with um, like a crime scene tape, and um, it has to be every corner has to be sealed, and uh, we initial over that tape every every corner of that box gets initialed. Um, it's called a chain of custody. I write the day, time, where I'm located, and that I sealed the box when I hand it off to someone else. Like if I were to give take the box and then give it to you, Dr. Char, you would then document that it was received on June 1st at 7.30 p.m. at Mars Catholic High School, um, and now you're taking possession of that box. And then if you were to hand it off to somebody else, same exact thing. Everybody, it's called a chain of custody. So every person that has that box is now responsible for anything and everything that would happen to that. So there's always another level to cases that come in. Um, It's what's called the drug facilitated sexual assault. Um, This is something as you're talking to the patient, you may realize that there's something else not right. Um, The patient also may say that they were given a drink and there was something in that drink. Um, So we would take a urine sample and a blood sample, and that would also be sent off to see if there are certain drugs or alcohol in their system that they are not admitting to using, Um, which, you know, is a big concern for patients. Um, My first patient, actually, that I got called in on was a 14-year-old patient from Far Hills, And if anybody knows Far Hills, it's a very nice area. And I thought being a forensic nurse in Mars County, how bad could it be? We live in a very nice area. Our kids are good kids. They're not out doing anything. Well, it really opened up my eyes. Uh, So this patient was from Far Hills. She went to a party at a barn and was drinking, which she knew she was drinking. They were drinking um, out of a huge punch bowl and nobody knew what was in the punch bowl. So, you know, I'm thinking, did they not teach you guys anything in school? And, you know, when you're a kid and you're out with your friends, you know, unfortunately everything parents say goes out the window. And so they were putting stuff in these drinks and watching these girls drink it. And then actually she was sexually assaulted later on that evening by one of the, the guys at the party that was, watching all these young girls drinking this punch bowl. So we ended up having to do um, drug testing on her. But again, she was 14, which was a pretty bad case. So what we're really looking for is biological evidence from the person that they're alleging assaulted them. Um, So again, we take the victim's clothing If there's a condom involved, usually if somebody's being sexually assaulted, there's not a condom involved. Um, We are taking their bedding, their towels, their clothes, their underwear, um, anything that we can get that can prove um, that the person that they're talking about is whose DNA is found on this patient. So these are just some other areas that are good sources of DNA. And this is how long biological evidence lasts on a person. Oral to oral contact is only one hour. Skin to skin is two days. Digital penetration can only be up to 12 hours. With this said though, we do still do the exam based on what the patient told us happened. If the patient tells us that the perpetrator um, was kissing her or him, I would still swab the inside of that patient's mouth just to see if we would get um, get any DNA in there. So even though these are these are time frames, 
this is these are not dead stops. We would still go ahead and do our full exam on this patient. <clears throat> and here's here's Dr. Char's uh, baby. The um, we spend a lot of time learning about the neurobiology of trauma, and I do not think I'm an expert at all, and I'm always learning, but I always do find it extremely fascinating on trauma patients. Um, these are some of the statistics as far as why patients um, don't report. These are some staggering statistics. <clears throat> but why don't they report? Because of the, the neurobiology that goes on with trauma. And trauma is a combination of fear, horror, terror, actual or perceived. And each person's perceived trauma is different. Um, what feels harmful and traumatic to one person doesn't necessarily feel traumatic and harmful to another person. And the changes that can occur on these in these patients' brains after a traumatic event, such as a sexual assault, can, can last days, weeks, months, um, and it really can change the actual biology of the brain from these experiences. <clears throat> so problems with patients after a trauma like this is the ability to give an account of exactly, exactly what happened. We had, I had a lecture one time that they sort of explained it as Take every event that you did in a day and write each event on a post-it note. Fold that post-it note up. As you're writing them out, you know, I woke up in the morning, I brushed my teeth, I ate breakfast, I went to school. Think about doing that for the entire day and then taking those post-it notes and throwing them up in the air and putting them on the ground. And then trying to figure out what you did first, what you did next, and what you did after that. So it kind of makes it make makes a lot of sense when patients after a trauma such as a sexual assault come in to the emergency room and they can't remember what happened. And a lot of times I get patients trying to explain to me what happened and as they're talking, all of a sudden they'll remember something else. And they'll say, wait, I was here. I remember that now. And understanding the biology of it and the way patients process trauma, it, it, it makes a lot of sense and it gives you a lot more compassion and, and is it, you're able to treat that patient a little bit better. <clears throat> and it may also, patient, people that don't believe the neurobiology of trauma may even think that the patient's making it up that, well, if they didn't say that in the beginning, that seems like a pretty big piece of evidence. Why wouldn't they tell you that? Well, because of the neurobiology of trauma, because of the way that that brain processes trauma, that may be why that huge piece of what you think to the puzzle is missing from them. <clears throat> um, so just to kind of wrap it up. So as far as victims, any time a victim goes into the emergency room, seeking care for a lot of things, but we'll focus mainly on sexual assault right now. Um, there's no fee there. They do not get charged. Their insurance company will not be charged. The patient does not have to pay. The patient's parents do not have to pay. If the patient is in a college in New Jersey, they do not have to pay any of the medications, the treatment, any screenings, any before care and after emergency room care, none of that is paid for by the patient. It is all covered by the state. And all of our patients are always given information to follow up with at home. If it's a patient that they're afraid to go home with paper, sometimes we'll have them screenshot phone numbers and put them in their phone. Um, at least if they can have even one main number that they can call and then they can get help from there. So we do have to work around certain situations that the patients are being assaulted at home and are afraid to go home. So, um, so again, in conclusion, just to know a sexual assault is without 
the patient, the person's consent. <clears throat> and, um, you know, I, I hope if any of you were in this situation, you ever have any questions, obviously you can always ask me if you see me around. Um, but also don't be afraid to pick up a phone and call any hotlines, police officers, you're never gonna get in trouble for asking for help. Any questions? <laughs> okay. I have a thousand questions, but I'd rather the kids ask questions. So what do you guys got? Anything? How much of your job would you say is actually like doing the medical stuff versus <laughs> like knowing how to deal with people and help people after going through something so traumatic? Um, so for my job, I am pretty much focused on the actual patient and what's happening to them at, at that emergency room visit. So I, what do you, do you mean as far as like training purposes? Uh, no, I think I, I just like in the work you do with the patient, how much of it is like focus on the medical or like to actually get to the medical part how much do you have to kind of deal with making sure the patient is like comfortable or yeah it, at least kind of like able to kind of like go forward with whatever work you have to do with them it it kind of all goes hand in hand um you're you know i'm pretty much trying to console the patient um trying to figure out what happened to them trying to let them know that they're okay. Um, and sometimes, you know, it, it is about trying to get justice for them to make sure that they are heard. And so it is a lot of back and forth between consoling the patient and medically talking to them. But I've been a nurse for a long time and talking to patients, you find out a lot of information just in every everyday conversation or what they think is everyday conversation, you can get a lot of medical information out of patients. <clears throat> Did that answer your question? Yeah, thank okay. you. <laughs> is it hard to stay objective when you're talking to the patients? It is, it is. And, um, you know, the mom in me has one opinion and the nurse in me, um, you know, I'm, I'm constantly trying to reel myself back in and look at it from an objective point of view. And I have to keep from this. This is my job. My job is to remain objective. You know, you want to make sure that that patient is safe and what that patient is alleging that the perpetrator did. You know, you want to make sure that that everyone is telling the truth. What was the um, training process like to get this specialization after you were already like a registered nurse? So I, it took me probably about a year and a half. I had to do a, I did a full um, online course. There's an international association of forensic nurses that um, I had to join and go through all of their training for pediatrics and adults. And then we had to do hands-on clinical training. Um, where we actually um, went to Monmouth, um, the medical school, I, I guess, I don't even know if it's a medical school. There's like a huge medical facility at Monmouth University that we went to. And they actually had people, live people, that their job is to be human models and patients. So we did full exams. Um, you know, we were given scenarios and we'd have to take care of that patient as if that scenario had happened to them. So it was probably four weekends that we had to go and do that um, to do practical exams. And then I did training with the prosecutor's office as far as then orienting to the, the way that Mars County does it. <clears throat> I had some notes just for the kids about when you mentioned man mandated reporters, so any any of you who have asked to talk to me individually, 
we probably I've probably you've probably heard me say that. Oh, just so you know, I'm a mandated <laughs> reporter. If you say anything about you know anything having been ab abused, assaulted, or that you're going to do yourself harm, or you're going to do somebody else harm, I have to report it. And once we get all that uncomfortableness, then we continue on with our conversation. Um, but so actually, the person that I worked with at um, in Baltimore is Allie Villamater, and she gives a lot of talks at those things. I don't know if that name rings a bell with you. No. No. Because uh, we I started this program at Gilman, which is a school in Baltimore, and uh, she she was highly involved in it because she gave a, a talk just like you did, um, brought in a, a kit and everything. I have that in one of my drawers. If any of you want to actually see it uh, at some other time, I can show it in class. I um, had I had one in my house during COVID in case something were to happen. <clears throat> we all had all of our equipment at, at home. Um, which I guess I don't even notice, but my kids were walking by and they're like, why is that here in the house? Um, but with the mandatory reporting back to that, we have to report when something bad is happening to a kid, a young adult, when we're in the position of authority, don't, please don't take that though as a threat. Or is that we don't, we're trying, we, as a mandatory reporter, we're not doing it to get you into trouble. That's not what we're trying to do, but we have to get you help. So don't be afraid to say something to someone. Um, I don't know, personally, I think nurses are great. Nurses, usually nothing phases me. Um, you know, so you always want to let people know if something is happening, did happen to you, to somebody else. And it's not to get you in trouble. It's to help you, honestly. I think I may have shared this story with some with my AP class, but there there are some bad actors uh, in administration, not at Morse Catholic. OK, I have not had that experience here where where like I've gotten in trouble in the past where an administrator says, why did you, why did you allow the kid to say something that I then had to report? And I was like, cause I didn't read their mind, but they like, where they don't want, they, t they tell you I'm a mandated reporter to tell you not to talk you, you, the person who needs the help. Right. Mm -hmm. And we're, I am totally against that. If you need to talk to somebody, you can talk to us. You just need to know that, that we have to let people know, right? That's not just about protecting you. It's also about protecting us too, which is important. But but that I'm looking out for you, that all of the teachers are looking out for you. They're not going to be like, don't tell me that because I don't want to start anything. Okay, I hope that <laughs> sinks in. Because someday I am going to write a book. <laughs> and I, I know the title is going to be Not in the Business. I think I did tell some of you this story where at one of the schools I worked at very early in my career, um, the president, the headmaster of the school said, we are not in the business of saving kids. And I, I was like, I can't wait to write my memoirs. And just, that's going to be the title, not in the business, because that is so antithetical to what we're supposed to be doing. We're supposed to help you grow and, you know, mature. And that's hard to do when you're being told you can't actually tell us what happened or whatever. Um, <clears throat> out of curiosity change of subject is there is there in your experience a time of day in which uh these type of things occur more there's not there's not because when i first started doing this <clears throat> i think it was like a tuesday at 11 o'clock in the morning and i was on call and i thought what a great time to go get our nails done so me and my girls were going to get our nails done and as we're getting in the car i got a phone call so there's there's no rhyme or reason to when you get called. You can almost always guarantee on a holiday or the few days after holidays, especially with children um, of divorced parents, that um, young children that go back and forth between the parents um, will typically get calls then. Um, New Year's Eve, always, always a call. I had a call not this past New Year's, the New Year's before, <clears throat> a young girl, 18, 19, I forget how old she was, was at the Iron Bar 
dancing, drunk, got separated from her friends. The bar, um, bouncer at the bar asked her to leave. Her friends didn't know she left. She went out walking behind um, the bank that was there and was assaulted um, behind a dumpster right in the middle of Marstown. So. Statistically though, most <laughs> sexual, if I, correct me if I'm wrong, most sexual assaults are done by the perpetrator or somebody you know, right? Um, a lot of cases they are. Um, I would say in this area, we don't get a lot of, you know, scooped up on the side of the road and, you know, taken somewhere and assaulted. Most patients that we see are friends, acquaintances, family members, caregivers. Um, you know, I had a patient who was autistic and she was an autistic children, a, a, an autistic child and another family had another autistic child. So the parents would take turns watching the autistic children. So the parents could go out at night every once in a while for a date night. And it turned out that the one father was sexually assaulting the um, autistic daughter of the other family when the parents were going out. But the daughter was nonverbal and not able to tell them. And he, he ended up going to jail. <clears throat> Do you have to, is this, a, are you required to see a therapist? They are not required. Are you, I mean, like, am the, I a, like yeah. a debriefing? No, no. Mm -mm. no. So, so they don't. So in your, in your line of work, it's not, they don't think it's necessary to, to ensure, I don't know how to put this. See in, in the, social work side, they're all required to see a therapist um, them for themselves to kind of not just debrief, but also deal with their own stuff. And so I was just wondering if since you got, you have to deal with so much stress, if you were required to take the burden off and any type of stigma. <clears throat> off. No, no, we're not, we're not required. I think they think nurses can just handle everything. <laughs> Yeah. They just sort of expect us to deal with it. <laughs> yeah. But it typically, typically after a case, I usually do call my boss to kind of debrief and kind of go over stuff um, more in case I forgot something or if I'm missing something. Um, the last thing you want is a case five years from now to end up at trial and mm -hmm. you have to go back and, and recount everything that you did. So I typically debrief um, just to make sure that that I I covered everything and I didn't miss anything because if I go if I did I could always go back and add an addendum to any of my cases. Anybody else have anything else? I know it's more infrequent, but do you ever have to deal with like someone who's like a male victim? Yes, yes, I have had male victims. I have probably one of the worst cases that I saw was a male victim. Um, I also had a victim who was being assaulted by his cousin. And that cousin was on a rescue squad in a town not far away from him. You know, un unfortunately, this is happening all around you. Um, and you don't, you don't even realize it, you know, you need to kind of always be aware of what's going on around you. If you're out with friends, always make sure that you know where your friends are. Always have, you know, an eye on at least one of your friends, you know, buddy up. Um, the, the one who was being assaulted by his cousin, he was being assaulted by him for years and the this was the oddest sentence I'd ever heard. They had him, he had to report, he had, had to um, go through Megan's law. So he could no longer be on the volunteer rescue squad. And he had to spend one year in jail. And then every year on this, the, the boy he was assaulting his birthday, he had to spend one day in jail for the rest of his life to know that he took away a year out of this child's, this guy's life for the rest of his life. 
and he was he was 16 15 16 like from the more medical side is there any difference in how you approach like a male victim versus a female vi uh, victim or is it like pretty much the same procedure just um you would still do a full i always do a full head to toe exam um only because you never know if a patient is missing something that might have happened to them um but you also go a lot on what they they told you happened you know if they told me that they were being held down by their arms um you know i would be looking on their arms for abrasions um bruising if they said that they were dragged through the woods i would be looking on their back or their side or their legs but i'm always looking from i look through every patient through their hair behind their ears under their feet behind between their toes everywhere i'm always looking for evidence anywhere and everywhere on a patient yes but obviously males have different anatomy than females but based on what the patient tells you happens that sort of starts starts the process off where to where to start looking for evidence <clears throat> Caitlin, is Caitlin next to you? Yes. Yeah. So, so today in our discussion, I said uh, I asked them what percentage of women get sexually assaulted in college, which is to me as as a kind of neuro, I guess you call me a neurosociologist or something. I I I find it fascinating what numbers people throw out about this in, <laughs> what, what is the number so she gave me the the classic number which one i found four. fascinating what did you say one in four is the classic number four, 25 yeah. right but <clears throat> that's that's the number that's always thrown around yeah. um but i was even in the, trying to do research on it what numbers guys versus girls the numbers are sometimes one in three one in 10, um, any way you look at it, the numbers are, are pretty high. Yeah. Even if it's, even if it's one in 10, Yeah. you know, how many people are on this call? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Plus six. Yeah, so there's 16 on this call, you know? So yeah. you're, you're looking at it possibly, even if it's a one in 10, up to two people. Yeah. Yeah. You know, that's those are those are pretty high numbers. We because of Morris County, we have fairly Dickinson, um, uh, Drew University, and um, is there another school? FDU, fair. Um, no, I forget. There's, I think there's three colleges. I don't know. I do get patient. I did have patient from Drew University. I had actually two patients from Drew University. <clears throat> um one somebody met online met up with a guy and agreed to go to his house for the weekend in connecticut she never met him never met him before yeah. you know i i do think a lot of this online stuff is a slippery slope you think you know people um and I had another patient um, who was, somebody just broke into her dorm room and assaulted her at Drew University. Hmm. So again, un unfortunately there there is a lot more, It it's opened my eyes up to a lot of things. Yeah. <clears throat> I, I also had, this was a case I'll never forget. So do you mind if I tell you all my cases? I have, I have cases I have cases for days I could go on and on about. But like I said, going out, especially when you're in college, make sure you have buddies that you at least keep an eye on. So I am patient. She was 15, 16, 17, didn't drive yet. So she must have been under 17, didn't drive. They Ubered into New York City. One of them had a fake ID and bought a table at a bar for bottle service. So once they had that one fake ID, they had all the alcohol that they needed at this bar. So they didn't have to keep going up to the bar. I don't know how people passed for 15, 16 years old in a bar, but they did. <clears throat> but they seated them at a table by the door. So one of the off-duty bartenders 
was there looking for somebody to take home that night. So he was watching this table, waiting for them to get drunk enough. As one of the girls, he just kind of went up to the door and shuffled her out the door. Her friends never even knew she was gone. He got her in a cab and back to her his apartment before anybody even knew she was gone. He took her cell phone and her shoes and assaulted her for two days. And when she finally was able to escape into the hallway, she found a cleaning lady and kind of realized, like, I don't know where I am. I don't know what's happening. And the cleaning woman got her downstairs and got her in a cab back to New Jersey. She's from Basking Ridge or Bedminster, but she was already all the way in New York. <clears throat> but he knew he was preying on young girls that night, watching and waiting and knew what was going to happen. And he, he, the scenario couldn't have played out any better for him, unfortunately. I think I've said this to you, to all of you at, at some point where, you know, you go through these dare programs early on in your education, right? Say no to drugs and all that. Right. And you probably had the same impression that I had was who's going to ask me to do drugs. When you get to college, you'll get asked every single day. Hey, you want to go smoke some pot? Hey, I've got this cocaine. Hey, I just got some heroin. Do you want to, you know, like you get asked every single day. And I said this, I gave the speech. My sisters are eight years younger than me. So I was getting out of college and I gave them this speech. I'm like, you're not going to believe me until you get there, but <laughs> you will be. And that's, I'm talking about small school. So university it's it's even easier, but you will get asked every single day. And I was like, I, I always joke only half joking that my sisters are some of the most masculine people I know, right? They can, they, I don't have to worry about them in a physical altercation with pretty much anybody, especially Kate. She knows every piece of martial arts and stuff like she will kill me. <laughs> um, and so I don't have to worry about her. However, if you drink out of an, a red open cup, it is the easiest thing in the world to just slip something in it. And you may and, not even be drinking alcohol. You may right. be having soda and they can put yeah. something in it. Right. And it doesn't, it doesn't really have much, it doesn't have a flavor. It, it might be a little salty, but that's it. Like you wouldn't, you wouldn't notice. And so do not ever, I don't care if you're underage or, you know, of, of age, don't just don't drink out of a red cup. You know, there's step <laughs> one. And, and here's the problem that I, that I've come up with when I'm dealing with this, pol the policy surrounding this is all of a sudden it sounds like victim blaming. I'm telling you ladies, especially don't drink out of a red cup. And it sounds like, oh, it's my fault. Right. Well, no, I'm, I'm just pretty much saying like, like people are jerks. People are going to take advantage of you. So, so just be safe. You know, a lot of you, I, I think I said this before, like, what do you do when you're walking through an open parking lot? And all of you pretty much say, oh, carry your keys in your, you know, all facing out and stuff. Yeah, sure. That's, that's great. How about you not walk through a, an open parking lot in the middle of the night by yourself? You know, I, I'm not victim blaming here, but, but because guys can get assaulted too. And if everybody was a little smarter about their situ situational awareness, then, then things would be a little easier. Well, thank you very much. Uh, we've held you over a bit, but uh, that That's was okay. really great. We'd probably <clears throat> like to have you in person once things open up. Um, I, I'm actually going to do a, a sit down talk with the parents, I think of at least the freshmen next year about priorities and what, what they want to get, what th they want their kids to get out of school. Um, because, uh, the, you know, this type of education is really important. You know, it was, it's, it's hard to listen to, um, or maybe it's not for you guys. I don't know. It's hard to listen to for me. Uh, and do you guys find it, do you guys find it weird, shocking, not shocking? What do you guys think? Shake your I'm head. Are you, weird. are you, are you surprised by this? I, I, sadly, I'm not surprised at least. It's still, it's not like enjoyable to hear, but it's not like I'm taken aback by it. Okay. And I feel like it's something that needs to be talked about regardless. So to, even if I have to like, kind of like force myself through certain things, it's, I think, worthwhile in the end. Okay. It's, right. it's very interesting. And I always loved the side of it that kind of intersects with law enforcement. Um, so I, 
I always find it fascinating. And like I said, I find I I find the human body fascinating. So this just sort of kind of melds the two together. And it's it's really, really interesting. And whenever I can get somebody put in jail, I've had four actually. It doesn't sound like a lot, but in my four or five year career as a forensic nurse, arrests and put in jail, I'll take it. You know. <clears throat> Okay, well, thank you very much, um, and we'll probably continue the conversation over the next week. So, and, and you're welcome to call in if you want, if you want to join us during those Anytime. periods. All right. <laughs> thank you very much. All right. Thanks, guys. Good night. All right. Good night. Good night, everyone.